Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. In today's session, we are going to have a discussion on the Hindu newspaper of 11th of March 2024. But before we begin, a quick announcement for all of you. There is a workshop that we are going to conduct on 16th of March at 6 p.m. So please, if you are somebody who is preparing for this examination and want strategy to understand with regards to how to prepare for the exam, this is a workshop that will help you. Now, let's look at the topics that we have for today's analysis. Now, the first three topics that you see, the first three topics actually are related topics and this is with regards to all the discussion and all the debates and controversy regarding election commissioner Arun Goyal and his resignation. So we'll discuss about certain factors with regards to what's happening and what are the things that we need to look into uh, as a way forward. So these three articles we'll discuss together. Then article number four and five, both are related to water crisis that we have seen in Karnataka and especially in Bangalore. So that is basically what we are going to discuss in these two articles. And again, these two articles we will cover together. And then lastly, we have an article in editorial with regards to election campaign spending. So we'll discuss about some of the issues there and some of the things that we can learn from some other countries as well. So these are the things that we are going to discuss in detail. Then apart from that, there are topics from the prelims perspective. So these are the five topics that we are going to discuss. The first is about gig workers suffer from lack of social security regulations. Now this article basically Today we are going to discuss in not a lot of detail because this exact study and all the details of the study are supposed to be out today. So maybe tomorrow's session we can actually go and discuss all these things in detail. Here we'll look at some of the basics that have been released with regards to this study. And then there are there is one article with regards to Cheetah and we'll discuss about that. Uh, then the new toll collection system that was announced last week, uh, last month. And then about bitcoins and something called as bitcoin halving. What is bitcoin halving? And then a study on golden langurs in India. So these are the articles that we are going to discuss in today's session. First, to look at what's exactly happening with regards to election commission and some of the discussions that are happening around it. So first article, which is on page number one. Differences with CEC may have led to Goel quitting. Now what we see is that election commissioner Arun Goel resigned unexpectedly just probably a week before the Lok Sabha election announcements were about to happen. And that's why what we are saying is that maybe there have been apparent differences with the chief election commissioner Rajiv Kumar during a visit that might have happened uh, to West Bengal. Now the reports say that he had serious differences with the chief election commissioner and this has led to his early return to Delhi and he skipped a press conference about election preparations in West Bengal. Now overall, uh, we do not really know what are the exact nature of uh, the resignation and it was uh, the resignation was sent to the president without informing the chief election commissioner and it was actually accepted in uh, a couple of days back on March 9th. Now, overall, although his term was supposed to be until November 2027, but he has resigned. So overall, that's why there are speculations. There are a lot of questions being raised by the opposition parties as well. Uh, so we do not exactly know what happened, but these are some of the reports that have been coming out. So this is what the first article basically says here. Then we have, so, so this is the first article that he basically has resigned. Then there is the second article, panel headed by PM likely to appoint new election commissioners by March 15th. Now overall what we understand is that uh, before this there has been another resignation as well or rather retirement and this retirement was of Anup Chandra Pandey and this also has led to another uh, vacancy in the election commission. So these two are the seats that have to be filled by a selection committee that will be headed by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi by March 15th. 
Now overall, uh, what is expected is that a high level selection committee is likely to meet on March 14th to fill these vacancies and a search committee will be shortlisting five names for each of the post and with the final appointment uh, will be made by the president under the new law that was passed during the winter session of the parliament and where also we saw that there were a lot of controversies where it faced a lot of opposition uh, from uh, the uh, opposition parties with regards to the fact that it might potentially undermine the election commission's autonomy. So these are the things uh, that we see here in uh, context and we also need to understand that we talk about an urgency that is required in this appointment because the Lok Sabha uh, election announcements are about to happen very soon and that's why uh, the election commission vacancies have to be filled very quickly, especially given all the criticism that is happening uh, over the current scenario where you just have a single member status of the election commission. So let's try to understand some of the key things that have been mentioned here. And in this regard, so this is basically this, what the second article says. And in this regard, there is this one article that you have on page number 13, which is a very crucial article with regards to um, an analysis of some of the previous cases that we have seen in the courts with regards to what is the role of election commission and what are the various aspects of ele election commission and how do we need to function with regards to this. So that's why there are certain cases that have been mentioned in this particular article and analysis of those cases sp specifically become important for us to understand. The first case that has been mentioned in this article, the first case that has been mentioned in this article is the SS Dhanua versus Union of India case. Now in this SS Dhanua versus Union of India case, it is a case that was decided in 1991. And this is something that revolved around the roles and powers of the election commissioners in relation to the chief election commissioner. Now what it did is that it addressed the independence of the chief election commissioner and also the election commission and the need for defining the roles within the commission and also the circumstances under which the co uh, all the posts of the election commission should be uh, abolished. So now the Supreme Court basically had found that the appointment of the election commissioners uh, when there was no substantial need for uh, looking at or let's say uh, note substantial need that is uh, it was undermining the uh, commission's effectiveness and it clarified that the chief election commissioner holds a very high status and a status which is higher than all the election commissioners and that also ensured that commission's smooth functioning does not depend on having multiple commissioners without clearly defining their rules. And that's why when it comes to the essence of this discourse around all uh, the cases like SS Dhanoa versus Union of India, we very often focus on ensuring uh, the election commission of India's autonomy and the ability of it to function without any undue influence and also ensuring that they are the ones who are safeguarding the democratic uh, processes through the maintenance of a free and fair electoral system in the country. Now this case is also very frequently cited in discussions which are around the balance of power within the election commission of India. Whether it should be a single member uh, commission or should it be a multi-member body and also the broader implications for the democracy and the governance in India with regards to how they are supposed to function and how they are supposed to go forward. So that's why this becomes a very crucial, uh, uh, a, a very crucial aspect of this uh, segment. So that's why when it comes to this SS Dhanoa versus Union of India, that's why this is a case that has been cited in, in this particular article with regards to where do we see the election commission of India heading and what are the things related to it. And especially given the fact that now you have a single member election commission currently, we need to understand the various aspects of it. And that's why it also discussed with regards to whether it needs to be a single member committee or there should be multiple members. So this was one set of uh, discussions that hover around this judgment and at the same time uh, the broader implications of 
how exactly do we see the importance of the election commission of india with regards to uh, the democracy and governance uh, in india now there is another case that has been mentioned in this particular article and this is about the tn session case uh, that is tn session versus the union of india now in this judgment this is a judgment that refers to a very significant ruling by the supreme court of india and this is also something that dealt with the powers and the structure of election commission of india now back then tn session was the chief election commissioner and he is also somebody who is known for his reforms and the kinds of elections that he was able to conduct all across the country whether at national or at state levels the work that has been done by tn session has been commendable in some of the states specifically where uh, the elections were known to be rigged and there were a lot of issues with regards to elections and the kinds of violences that used to happen during the elections he is somebody who is known for reforming or bringing in a lot of reforms with regards to elections in india now he was the election commissioner at the time when the uh, supreme court this ruling judgment happened and uh, when it comes to him we know that he was very significantly known for uh, strengthening the functioning of the election commission of india uh, commission of india and the role that it plays in ensuring free and fair elections in the country now in this judgment the supreme court of india talked about article 324 of the indian constitution and we'll discuss about article 324 uh, as well because article 324 altogether deals with the election commission and all the aspects of election commission now one of the key points of contention with regards to uh, the tn session case was the fact that uh, whether when it comes to election commission of india whether election commission of india must be a multi member body or could it exist as a single member body without uh, with only let's say just one election uh, chief election commissioner now the supreme court's judgment had clarified that the president of india had the discretion to appoint more than one election commissioner and that's why in a manner you can say that it uh, in a manner you can say it can be interpreted as saying that the election commission is a multi member body if deemed necessary by the president now this was seen as a move to also ensure a broader basis for decision making within the election commission of india and potentially also reducing the uh, uh, concentration of power in the hands of a single individual and promoting a more collective approach to decision making so that's why there are these things that come into the picture that let's say when you are saying that there is an election commission which is supposed to look after the democratic process in the country and while looking into the democratic process of the country there is only one member that decides everything so is that fair in that sense that should we not have a multi member body where there the decision is also democratic the the decision about democracy is also democratic so that was one of the uh, discussions in these cases and at the same time there is the other aspect of the discussion as well that when you have multiple view points then in that case decision making is not that easy and if the other election commissions also have an equal power as the election commission commissioner of india or the chief election commissioner of india then in that case decision making could become very very difficult so that's also one of the things that have been discussed in these of the cases now one thing uh, most importantly when it comes to article 324 of the indian constitution which deals with the election commission of india and all the the things regarding it whether the composition the powers the functions the responsibilities all these things are there in article 324 now this article it provides a very comprehensive framework for the administration of elections in india and ensuring that the conduction of elections in india is free and fair whether it is about the parliament whether it is about the state legislatures or even the office of the president of india and even the vice president of india so that's why all these things will directly or indirectly be related to the election commission of india now overall when you look at uh, the article the article especially the first two clauses are important and especially because in this article also the uh, clause 2 has been taken into account and the cases also that we discussed especially with regards to the tn session case it talked about the uh, second clause now first says the superintendence direction and control of the preparation of electoral rolls for 
and the conduct of all elections to the parliament legislature of any state of uh, in every state and elections to the offices of the president and the vice president held under the constitution shall be vested in a commission referred uh, as the election commission commission in the constitution of india so that's why it talks about that every kind of election that is happening as a part of the democratic process in the country will be a part of election commission of india and then the second clause and this is very very important that it shall consist of the chief election commissioner and such number of other election commissioners if any if any as the president may form uh, from time to time fix all right so president has to fix the number according to this and appointment of the chief election commissioner and other election commissioners uh, commissioners shall subject to the provisions of any law made on of the on the behalf of the parliament made by the president so that's why here that's why all this discussion whether one is enough whether we need to have more because the number of other is also not defined so that's why there are all these things so for example when it comes to article 324 clause 1 it establishes the election commission and also allows for the appointment of the chief election commissioner and all uh, everyone with regards to the same and uh, in this regard when it comes to uh, uh, clause 2 this is where we see that uh, the president also has the power in a manner which has been vested by the parliament to the president and this is where when other election commissions are also appointment the chief election commission commissioner will act as the chairperson of the election commission so that's why especially when it comes to uh, article 324 part 2 or clause 2 this is where it is something which we see that uh, it becomes very very crucial because it talks about how exactly the composition will be so overall and clause 1 basically talks about how exactly the emission election commission will be supervising directing and controlling the entire process for the conduction of election to the parliament and the legislature of the states and also the election to the offices of the president and the vice president so that's why this these are two clauses which become very very crucial in this aspect similarly uh, it also talks about other uh, when you look at the other clauses it also talks about uh, for example clause 3 and 4 talks about the detail of the power of the president to appoint the regional commissioners to also assist the election commissioner uh, to the conditions of the service and tenure which are also determined by the president of the country so that's why we see that in this regard article 324 especially becomes very very crucial because uh, it becomes very important especially given the fact that we are looking at elections or, or the national elections this year this is very very crucial and there will be i mean this will be an article that will keep following up with in the upcoming lectures as well so that's why overall we need to understand the importance of the election commission and how it plays a very very significant role in the country's democratic process so overall you can say that in a manner they are like the guardians of free and fair elections that they would be the ones to ensure that the elections are conducted in a free fair and very impartial manner which is very fundamental to maintaining the democratic ethos of this nation and that's why by doing so they also uphold the citizens trust in the electoral process Similarly, when it comes to the democratic rights, they also have to act like as the protector of the democratic rights. That first thing we are saying that these are, uh, that they are going to be like the guardians. So they have to be the guardians of free and fair elections. They have to be the guardians of free and fair elections and then they have to act as the protector of democratic rights. 
because the commission will be uh, trying to safeguard the democratic rights of the citizens to vote and choose their representatives and that's why it has to ensure that every eligible citizen is registered to vote and can exercise their rights without any bias or in without any influence similarly they also have to be the regulator of the political parties and candidates as well that by making sure that uh, the, the registration uh, the registration of political parties and the monitoring of their election campaigns or even financing is taken care of that uh, by doing uh, all this by ensuring all this the election commission will try to maintain a kind of a level playing field across all the candidates and all the contestants in this election uh, with regards to every party that is here similarly it also tries to prevent any undue influence or any uh, uh, it also tries to ensure compliances with regards to the legal and the ethical standards as well so that's why they also will become the regulators regulators of political parties regulators of political parties so that's where they play a important role there and also the enforcement of the model code of conduct through the enforcement of the model code of conduct the election commission also ensures that the election campaigns are conducted respectfully without any undue advantage and in a manner that respects the electoral uh, uh, process of the country and all the democratic process of the country so that's why uh, this is something also very very important that they play a very very important role in enforcing the model code of conduct then after that also in a manner you can say that they also help in maintaining political stability because ensuring that regular and timely elections are conducted election commission ensures that political stability and the continuity of governance can be ensured and this is also very essential for the country's development and prosperity altogether so that's why we have to understand that there are all these things that become very very crucial and that's why uh, all the controversies that have been happening around election commission and who will be the members and how the appointments will happen whether fair appointments will happen or not all these things become very very crucial in ensuring that the elections are happening free and fair and the democratic process is being followed and citizens rights are being safeguarded the democratic rights are being safeguarded and that's why election commission has to play a very very important role in this given scenario now coming to the next set of articles we have two articles here one on page number 8 with regards to gs paper 3 environment and also you can see in a manner related to gs paper 1 social issues because we also are talking about urbanization and the problems related to unplanned urbanization and then so page number 8 one article and then page number 9 one article so page number 8 crisis of time and page number 9 a possible solution for bengaluru's water crisis now what exactly are we discussing here what we have seen is that overall when it comes to uh, the water crisis it's not only about bengaluru but it's also about a larger problem that karnataka altogether has been facing the karnataka water crisis right now impacts over 7000 villages more than 1100 wards and one uh, almost 220 talukas and that's why primarily it is affecting uh two areas one the mysuru district and also the mandya districts along the kaveri river watershed and as at the same time what we also see is that there are crucial water sources that are there for bengaluru for example the kaveri river and also the krishna rajya sagar dam and they have been facing water crisis now despite uh, significant attention that has been given to bengaluru the crisis is not only about bengaluru but it goes way beyond that and it extends beyond the capital and goes to the entire state of karnataka and largely this is because of insufficient rainfall uh, in the last year and also at the same time uh, we see that because of shortage of rainfall the replenishment of kaveri river did not happen properly but at the same time when we look at the historic data that has been projected it shows that karnataka's rainy season has also shortened by almost 2 weeks of time over the last 20 to 30 years and 
at the same time what we see is that there is a lot of fluctuation in the rainfall as well. Now overall apart from all this crisis what we also see is Bangalore's lack of preparedness for water scarcity and especially given the status that it holds as being one of the wealthiest urban municipalities in the country. Overall, when you look at some of the official data, it consumes, you can say, approximately 1400 million litres of water daily from both Kaviri River and also from the groundwater reserves. Now, the groundwater recharge rate has been insufficient and that's why the large, last year's deficiency in the rainfall, it has further compromised the situation and that's why the, the replenishment of Kaveri River has been had, has not happened satisfactorily and that has created a demand deficit especially very acute away from the center of central areas of Bangalore. Now overall when we look at these scenarios we also have to understand about groundwater that the reliance on groundwater and water tankers in areas without piped water from the Kaveri River also highlights the problem that we have in the historical move that we have in Bangalore's history and also with regards to the use of distant water sources to the local lakes which basically have uh, been affected by unplanned urbanization and pollution. So overall there are a lot of factors at the same time climate change also introduces a, a problem and a disproportionate problem you can say where the unpredictable nature of climate change is also having an effect here. And this is where we see that there needs to be a very rapid government response and this also tries to underscore and emphasize the need for long term planning beyond just immediate crisis management. So there are these things that we have to understand and there are uh, aspects that we need to understand with regards to uh, the scarcity that we are looking at and the possible solutions that we have here. Now overall if you look at this map, this also this map also highlights what's happening and where the things are going wrong. That if for example, let's say when you look at map number 1 and map number 2, if you look at map number 1 and map number 2, what you'll see is that the central core areas, central core areas is where you do not really see a lot of differences between 2011 and 2021. But when you look at all the areas which have extended, which traditionally wouldn't be counted as the city limits of Bangalore. These are the areas where we see that the crisis is even far worse than the crisis that we see in the central parts of the city. And that's why we see that this water scarcity problem becomes a very complex issue altogether in the context of this. So that's why when you look at population increases, what we see is that there is a huge population increase that we have seen um, in, in, in Bangalore and the data says that from 8.7 million in 2011 it has gone up to 12.6 million in 2021 and most of the growth has been happening in the periphery. Most of the growth has not happened in the city limits or let's say the central parts but rather in the areas which are adjoining. So that's why the periphery is where the crisis also is. So that's why there are these things that have been mentioned here. Now overall when you look at uh, this article and that's why these are the numbers as I told you also that this is where we see that the issues are. Now when it comes to understanding of the current crisis, we see that the current crisis is huge and if you look at some of the maps, for example there is this map uh, that also represents what has been happening and how the changes have been happening in Bangalore. If you look at the map of 1973 and compare it to the map of 2020 you can see how fast the growth has happened and this is where in a manner we can say that this has been an unplanned growth this is not a planned growth this is not a planned urbanization and with everything and uh, all the developments that have happened in Bangalore and how it also started becoming IT hub of the country it needed a lot of planning that unfortunately did not happen on time and this is where we see that now the scarcity has started looming in and it has started creating a bigger challenge than what it should what it would have been if everything was planned well in time. 
Now, when we look at the water scarcity in Bangalore, this is, I would say in a manner, it's a complex issue which is resulting from a combination of a lot of factors. Some of these factors are outlined in these articles as well. But beyond those points also, there are some additional factors also which have contributed to the water scarcity in uh, Bangalore. Now, overall, first and the foremost, and a very obvious uh, thing has been the population growth and the kind of urban sprawl that we have seen in Bengaluru. There has been a rapid uh, increase in Bangalore's population and this has been driven by the major growth that has happened in the IT sector and how it became a hub for the IT sector and this has led to urban sprawl and increasing the demand for water which has completely outstripped the supply capacity that Bengaluru had. So that's why this has been one of the major challenges. So and I'm sure that you know about this. It's not something which is unknown to you. So one problem has been rapid population growth. Rapid population growth and rapid population growth and the urban sprawl that we see in Bangalore. So this is one of the challenges. Then apart from that, uh, so that's why it growing as an IT hub and all these companies and startups, etc. All that ecosystem developing in uh, in the city, that has been one of the challenges. Then apart from that, there has been an insufficient or rather inefficient water management. So inefficient water management. This has been one of the major challenges that we have seen that uh, the water management, I mean, in a manner you can say that the poor management of water resources, including the significant losses that we have seen in the distribution due to the leakages or maybe unauthorized uh, connections and constructions, etc. That has also led to this kind of scarcity. And at the same time, there has been an over reliance on very distant water source. For example, the dependency that uh, the city has on Kaveri River, which is more than 100 kilometers away. Way, uh, for a major portion of its water supply and that's why this also makes it vulnerable to the supply disruptions and that's why we see that there have been a lot of uh, political disputes also that have happened over water sharing of Kaveri River so that's why this also becomes one uh, problem that you can say that this is an over reliance over reliance on distant water source and this is also important from another perspective and this is something that we'll discuss about South Africa and Cape Town and there also there are certain similarities that we have seen then of course there are other factors there are climatic factors as well that over a period of time climate change and irregular rainfall patterns also have led to this kind of a crisis that there has been a changing climate pattern and this has led to unpredictable rainfall and contributing to drought conditions in some of the years and also not allowing for very consistent replenishment of water resources so that also is one of the challenges and at the same time inadequate rainwater harvesting also has been a problem so you can say climate change is a factor unpredictable rainfall has been a factor and lack of rainwater harvesting has been a problem lack of rainwater harvesting also has been a problem so overall what we have seen is that when it uh, comes to this uh, even despite having a potential to capture rainwater all the existing infrastructure and the practices for rainwater harvesting are insufficient in the city to look into all the or uh, uh, cater to the city's demands and then the depletion of groundwater excessive and irregular ex uh, extraction of groundwater also has led to a dramatic decrease in the groundwater levels and this has also made uh, it a very unreliable source altogether so that's a depletion of groundwater again becomes a, uh, a problem similarly the pollution of the water bodies so so first is again depletion 
of ground water and also water pollution water pollution also is a problem that we have seen that the industrial and sewage pollution has been uh, contaminated and uh, have contaminated a lot of cities lakes and rivers i mean bangalore and we'll discuss about this also that how bangalore has been known as city of lakes but now we see that that number also drastically has dropped so that's why we have said, uh, seen that because of water pollution, it has made water unsafe for consumption and it has also reduced the availability of clean water altogether. Similarly, we have seen that uh, there has been a lack of water recycling and reuse. Uh, not a lot of investments have happened in water treatment and recycling facilities, meaning that a large proportion of wastewater also is not being reused. It is missing an opportunity to even augment the city's water supply. Similarly, agricultural demand also has been a factor that water diversion for agricultural use in the surrounding areas has reduced the amount of water which is available for urban consumption. So that's why there are, uh, you can say overall, you can say that there is a lack of comprehensive planning uh, in a, an absence of a long term integrated water management plan. Uh, we see that there are these kind of issues that are drawing uh, towards the crisis. Now, uh, Overall, we need to understand that uh, the, there is a crisis and there we understand that there are all these issues that we have currently and this map also is a reminder of how things have changed and this is not only let's say about one city in India that is Bengaluru but this is something which will become a pattern in a lot of other cities as well and it's not that it's the only city which is facing this problem in the country you will see that there will be a lot more cities not only from the metropolitan areas but also from tier 2 and tier 3 areas where you'll see that all these issues will start coming up unless the local authorities there the state governments along with the central government starts planning starts planning ahead for this kind of crisis so that's why uh, we need to understand the issues and it's not that these are new issues. If you look at these articles, these are articles that have been published forever. For example, uh, this there, there is a good article that actually was published in uh, the Down to Earth website just a couple of days back. So you can read this article also as an additional reading if you want. And this if you see now, this is uh, an, a screenshot that I've taken not from a recent article. But I've taken this from a 2019 article, an article published in 2019. And if you go back and just do a basic Google search, you'll find that this crisis with that we are talking about in case of Bangalore, it's not a new crisis. It's a crisis that has been ever talked about. And it's that's why it's not that we did not know that this is going to happen. <coughs> we have seen this crisis looming. We knew about this crisis, but unfortunately there is a lack of vision and there is not only one body that is responsible for it. It's not that only local authorities are responsible for it. Local authorities, the state and the center all are responsible together when it comes to understanding of these issues because they had to solve for this problem. They knew about this problem just that in a manner it has been a lack of vision uh, more than anything. So that's why we see that there are all these issues that we have been talking about and because uh, this is where the co comparison came with in terms of Cape Town because in case of Cape Town we talk about day zero in 2018. Day zero basically meaning that that was the day when Cape Town ran out of water in 2018. So what we have seen is that Cape Town has faced very critical water shortage and notably when uh, it comes to 2018 this is when it peaked and the city ran out of water in 2018 and this situation was called as day zero. And the term was coined uh, as the day when the taps had no water uh, would be turned off. The residents would have to queue for water. There will be uh, a lot of issues uh, for very basic purposes also. There was no water availability. And that is where we see that now uh, a lot of environmentalists have also started drawing parallels between Bengaluru and 
Cape Town where uh, a lot of parallels do actually exist. For example, the severe droughts that both the cities have experienced. We have seen these kind of conditions uh, because of impact of uh, lack of water availability, urbanization, all these factors. And that's why rapid urbanization, the population growth in both the cities are also comparable. The kinds of growth rates that they have seen are also comparable. Then the over-reliance that we have seen on very limited water resources that both the cities primarily relied on finite water resources, uh, reservoirs that were vulnerable to kinds of depletion that we already see. And this is where we see that there have been uh, lacks, uh, there has been a lack of all these situations. Then uh, the kinds of water management challenges that we have seen, there also we see that the, there is a lot of parallels that are drawn by the environmentalists between Bengaluru and Cape Town. Then we need to understand that there are uh, a lot of things that needs to be done because we have seen that uh, in Cape Town after that there are stringent water restrictions that have been put in, uh, innovative water saving initiatives have been brought in and they have started becoming kind of a model for everyone else or every other city that is facing a similar challenge. But we do see that there are issues uh, that both these cities share. And in this context, there is one discussion that we need to do and this is about all the lakes of Bengaluru. Because when you look at the pre-urbanization uh, uh, history of Bengaluru, historically this has been a city that has boasted a very rich network of more than 1000 lakes and tanks which were designed to capture and utilize all the rainwater and that's why catering to the needs of agriculture, groundwater recharge and all the drinking water needs of the city. And that's why these uh, lakes would function as interconnected uh, network and that's why they allowed the overflow from one to feed into another. And that's why we see that we, they very efficiently were able to manage the monsoon waters also and prevented both droughts and flooding at the same time. And that's why these were very very crucial. But then we see that there are factors that led to the decline, rapid urbanization and unplanned urbanization. As Bengaluru started to transform into a very major IT hub and uh, a, a lot of companies and startups started to grow in this city, we see that rapid and very often unplanned urbanization expansion started to happen. And this is where we see that a lot of encroachments started to happen on lake lands. Many of the lakes were filled uh, and these lakes were filled just to make way for buildings or maybe roads or maybe for other infrastructure. We see after that we see that a lot of industrial pollution starts to come into the city. The discharge of uh, the untreated industrial waste and all the sewage into the lakes has very severely polluted the water and also has destroyed all the aquatic ecosystem and also made water kind of unsuitable for use. Then the kind of pressure that real estate has put on the city. The high demand for land in Bengaluru also put immense pressure on the lake areas. We saw a lot of encroachments and a lot of illegal land grabs as well that has led to the conversion of all the lake beds and many of the lake beds into residential and commercial spaces. A couple of years back if you remember in 2022 there were urban flooding situation that happened during the rainy season in Bangalore which was very uh, unheard of for a city like Bengaluru. But unfortunately it happened and why did it happen? Because a lot of these constructions in all these areas have happened on lake beds, have happened on all the lake lands and areas and that's why these, uh, these has led to uh, the, the groundwater not being fed, uh, the, lakes being not, uh, the lakes not being fed and all this leading to a lot of overflowing of water all across uh, these areas and that's why especially when you look at and if you do the analysis of which were the areas facing this problem the areas were the ones where rapid unplanned urbanization has happened on the areas which were supposed to be lake beds and you just have to just go and do a google search and you'll find all these images where they will show you the images of Bengaluru then versus Bengaluru now and the lakes then versus lakes now and how this entire situation has changed over time. And that's why there has been a kind of neglect and mismanagement that we have seen in this uh, scenario. That there has been a lack of coordinated efforts among various government bodies, whether at national, state or city level, that has led to these kind of crises. In many of the 
cases the boundaries of the lakes also have not been clearly demarcated and that has also led to a lot of encroachment and the loss of lake areas so that's why we see that there are a lot of situations these kind of issues that have happened a lot of siltation and debris uh, accumulation also has reduced the depth of the water uh, bodies and that also has led to the decrease in the water holding capacity of many of these lakes and that's why today we see that there has been a reduced number the number from more than 1000 has reduced to less than 200 lakes and many of these 200 also are in a very poor state right now very heavily polluted and also have been encroached upon this also obviously has also led to the other factors like loss of biodiversity in these kind of areas significantly impacting all the local ecological balance and biodiversity led to a lot of scarcity and urban flooding uh, of uh, of the city as well what we saw back in 2022 especially so we see that there are all these uh, problems and now we also see that there have been efforts uh, for uh, revival of these lakes as well the government also has been working towards it a lot of ngos have been working towards it and they have been trying to restore some of the uh, lakes in bengaluru and there are some good studies that you will find where uh, a lot of local efforts and locked off efforts from the ngos with the help of the local bodies and the government also has led to certain increase um, in the lake bed areas but still the crisis serves as you can say uh, overall a precautionary tale about the consequences of neglecting natural water bodies in the face of urban development and that's why it also underscores the need for very comprehensive urban planning that also integrates the conservation and the restoration of all the natural water systems in any given area so that's why we see that there are a lot of these things that the uh, environmentalists have been suggesting that they said that there are there is a requirement in ensuring that we have a sustainable intake and integrated water management strategy for uh, this city that first we have to enhance rain water harvesting so that's why this becomes very very crucial rain water harvesting Rainwater harvesting will be a very very important strategy expanding rainwater harvesting in urban and rural areas both it can significantly increase water availability and this also includes uh, maybe mandating rain har water harvesting systems for all the new constructions and all the um, uh, new areas being developed or maybe also incentivizing the installations in the existing buildings. Then at the same time revival and the restoration of the water bodies as we discussed that there have been some efforts where they have been trying to focus on the restoration and rejuvenation of the lakes the ponds and all the traditional water bodies uh, maybe by with the help of desiltation or, 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 or maybe uh, reducing the encroachment removing of the encroachment and also preventing the sewage inflow into these kind of water bodies and this is something that will help not only in increasing the water storage capacity but also in aiding in the groundwater recharge as well at the same time so that's why revival revival of natural water bodies recharge of uh, or revival of natural water bodies then wastewater treatment and reuse also can become very very crucial because implementing advanced wastewater treatment uh, technologies can also help us potentially not only in recharging of water but also helping in agriculture that maybe in agriculture also there is some water that can be uh, given and that was where we can actually reduce the fresh water demand that many of these industries have then so that's why the treatment in a manner you can say waste water treatment waste water treatment then uh, maybe also sustainable groundwater management is also required ensuring that uh, regulating that we regulate the groundwater extraction with the help of maybe permits or also encouraging the adoption of suitable uh, extraction methods this can also help in uh, conserving the crisis risk of the resources 
similarly we can look at some of the other water conservation practices as well we can also try to dim, uh, manage the demand of the city reducing the wastewater uh, uh, increasing public awareness about water conservation so these kind of things are also required so that we can decrease the per capita consumption of water and then overall uh, maybe also including all the stakeholders to ensure that there is an equitable and efficient use of water resources in the city then maybe for the future given the scenario climate resilient infrastructure is also required that uh, infrastructure that can withstand extreme weather events maybe like floods and droughts etc also becomes very crucial in ensuring water security so that's why uh, in construction also we'll have to look into these kind of efforts and then public awareness becomes very crucial so these kind of efforts also can become very very important and so overall we just need to look into all these possible solutions and how exactly can we cater to all the demands currently and also looking into the demands of the future how exactly can we plan ahead in time instead of looking into these kind of crisis and then starting to act on this crisis because when you act on a crisis you only look at a short term goal you only look at a short term scenario where you can solve some of these issues but we need to go beyond that and we need to understand how the situation has to be seen in this regard then uh, there is another very very important article this is on page number 9 we need limits on election campaign spending now here in this article there are some data that has been uh, given by the author with regards to what's happening so for example it takes uh, the the example of 2004 when india shining campaign was uh, launched by the then bjp led government so there was a very large scale india shining advertisement campaign that was launched and it costed approximately rupees 150 crores which also led to a lot of controversy on the use of public funds for uh, in a manner what was seen as uh, the political parties uh, advertisement so overall what we have seen is that both the central and the state governments have increasingly spent significantly a significant amount of advertisements before Uh, elections and this is where especially when it comes to an election year the expenditure is even far worse and that's why in some way we need some limits on the government spending because overall despite the necessity for governments to inform the public about all the policies and the schemes we see that there is a concern over the advertisement serving more as campaigns for the ruling party or uh, whether state or center because when you look at the data when you look at the amount of money that has been spent if you look at the data that has been given here for example so what we see is that expenditure altogether the central government has spent rupees 3020 crores on advertisement be between 2018 19 to up to 2022 23 so just imagine the kind of spending that is happening on elections and every party in one way or the other whoever will be the govern governing party will always be having more resources to spend and they would be able to spend more and the others will also be not left far behind so they also are going to spend a lot of money the official expenditure for example as the data says here declared by the bjp and congress for 2019 elections with 1264 crores and 820 crores respective respectfully so that's why we see that there are all these spendings and these spendings are huge uh, and then when we look at the supreme court guidelines for example the supreme court had let down guidelines to regulate the government advertisements back in 2015 and 16 and this also was about ensuring a level playing field uh, between the opposition and the ruling party yet we have always seen that whoever is the ruling government will always have an advantage in this area so overall that's why we need to understand where the limits are election expenditure limits right now if you look at the official expenditure limits of for the lok sabha candidates has been set at rupees 95 lakhs and 
um, for the larger states and for the smaller states 75 lakh rupees so now it's very widely known that these limits are very often just exceeded uh, and that is where we see that it starts to am amount to unfair electoral practices so uh, that's why so that's why these data also have been published here but we know that these are the spendings go far beyond behind that beyond that and at the same time we see that there are no limits on what political parties can spend during elections in 2019 this is the case for example that has been given uh, in this article itself that the actual spending actually is ex uh, ex estimated to be much higher uh, and that is where all the concerns with regards to the influence of uh, unaccounted money and all the corporate donations and uh, etc in the electoral process comes in so that's why we need to understand uh, a lot of things here with regards to how the things are and what the things are so overall when it comes to uh, this uh, there are issues that we need to understand so this is basically the context of this article so we need to understand the issues at large with regards to the spending and how exactly we need some kind of electoral reforms in this scenario and this has to be broadly uh, also connected to what we are looking at with regards to the electoral bonds issue so with regard to the ele electoral bonds issue we have seen that how supreme court has acted on it and again you see that there is a news article almost every day with regards to the current controversy on electoral bonds now when you uh, look at some of the things uh, before i mean issues you know about these issues there are certain good practices that you should know of and this uh, there are certain cases that have taken from uh, some of the countries internationally there where we see that there are several international models and case studies that have been showcasing how the good practices on electoral advertisements and campaignings can be done now few examples if you take sweden often is taken as the best example it's often cited as uh, a very transparent and equitable approach that it takes towards the political advertisement and the campaigning finance the public funding of the political parties and the campaign expenditure there is based on their performance in the elections and also provides for a very um, in a manner also a kind of a level playing field there additionally what we also see is that sweden also has very strong regulations on political advertisement they have restrictions on the political advertisements on television and that also uh, reduces the spending a lot if you take the case of canada another such example their approach to electoral campaign finance has been very comprehensive and they also have been putting very strict limits on the spending by parties and the candidates both at the same time as well as also the contributions from the individuals or the corporates and unions etc now what we see is that uh, there the law provides for a very transparent reporting system as well where all the contributions and all the expenditures must be disclosed and canada also allocates very free uh, in a manner free broadcasting time to all the political parties and this is something that also reduces the need for uh, significant advertisement spending so they would just give them free time on air on television that okay fine this is the time given to you you just go and advertise so then they do not have to spend a lot on campaigns and uh, social media and print media and all those different media resources instead they are given free air time on the television so that that's what we see in the in canada in the uk what we see is that in uk also there are certain um, acts that we have certain uh, laws that we have which also prohibits the political parties uh, to advertise outside of the campaign period so only during elections party politics broadcasts are allowed and without any charge they are also allowed to the political parties and this is where also we see that this is also based on their previous election performance and there are other factors for example they also try to ensure equitable access to the media and that is why there are strict spending limits also that they have put for all the parties and the candidates 
similarly we see that other parts of europe in case of germany also germany also has kind of a uh, mixed public and private funding system for the political parties and there also there are very strict uh, limits on the campaign spending and there are very transparent reporting requirements that they also have so that's why we see that uh, in all these cases when it comes to how much public funding uh, can be done so public funding will match the amount of the political that the political parties have received from the private donations up to a certain limit and they also it's very interesting that germany also encourages small donations right so they also have incentivized in a manner small donations political advertisements on television are also very limited and they also have been very clearly identified that okay this is a political campaign or this is an advertisement very clearly it has to be stated so that's why these models uh, if you look at all these models they f share some of the common features for span for example let's say we see that there are spending limits there are spending limits that we see in all these good practices similarly we see that uh, there are certain public funding mechanisms that they have and uh, they have public funding mechanisms public funding mechanisms and at the same time we see that equitable equitable media access is also given to them equitable media access because this is one thing that has become very problematic in India where we see that a lot of media, a lot of news channels and whether print media or digital media etc. They all have started choosing sites. Whether the governing side, whether the opposition side but they have started choosing sites. And that is where we see that there is a larger problem in media not being completely objective in reportage so that also becomes a challenge altogether and that's why there are transparent reporting requirements also that are very very important in this particular scenario that a lot of news should not be disguised as or a lot of advertisement advertisement should not be disguised as news this is something that becomes very very crucial then at the same time that's why we need to ensure that there is a fair competition and we reduce the undue influence of money in politics because ultimately when you look at all these numbers these are exaggerated these are huge numbers and that's why they represent a they represent a a, a, a problem a larger a larger problem where all these money this is public money a lot of this is public money this is a, a lot of this money is what has been collected as taxes from the citizens which are just being used for electoral advertisements and campaign financing so this is not correct altogether and this is sad in a manner that this much of money is just being spent on advertisements something that could have been spent on a lot of uh, uh, schemes and policies and all all the areas where they need money where they need budget where it could have helped the indian economy altogether instead of just being spent on and a lot of these numbers that we are speaking of these are numbers which are uh, num these are numbers which basically are reported numbers or official numbers we do not even know about what the unofficial numbers are and how the illegal money is playing a very big part in this entire system so there are possible reforms that we have and what we need so for example electoral bonds the transparency of electoral bonds that right now supreme court has been talking about that we need to ensure that uh, electoral bond scheme is transparent and also about uh, we know about the donors to the political parties uh, tracking of the flow of money and the influence that it perhaps has on political advertisement similarly having strict spending limits that implementing uh, and enforcing strict spending limits for the political advertisements is very very crucial because what we see is that there is a limit being put but uh, the entire system whether the limits are being uh, catered to or whether everything is being respected or not uh, probably not a lot of illegal money is flowing here we know that there is cash for vote kind of problems also that there are people being paid to vote for a certain party in many parts of the country so then in that case this is illegal money and it is not accounted for money so it needs to be transformed in this particular scenario similarly and whether it is uh, 
at the time of campaigning whether it is in the pre-election period how much money should be spent in the pre-election uh, uh, time period and during the campaigning it all also needs to be understood very well and very well defined altogether in this system and there needs to be a very transparent disclosure mandating very comprehensive and timely disclosure of all the political advertisements uh, or all the expenditures by the parties and the candidates is also required and that also includes detailed reporting of spending on different media platforms sponsored content digital advertisements all these things also need to be brought into the picture similarly uh, regulation of the digital advertisement also is very very crucial because we know that there is an in increasing influence of digital platforms in the uh, political campaigns and specific guidelines that's why on the spending limits for all the online advertisements also should be established and this also would include let's say uh, measures to ensure transparency of the sponsored political content on social media on digital platforms all these things will also help and as we also discussed that there needs to be an equitable access to media ensuring that all the political parties are getting their free time getting their access uh, to the media so that they can do their campaigns and they can talk about what they their vision is is also required and that's why overall strengthening of these mechanisms are very very important the larger issue of what we also discussed in election commission of india and how they become very very crucial in this entire scenario uh, including maybe penalties for violations and conducting audits from time to time about the campaign expenditures all these things will also help a lot in uh, these kind of areas now coming to the smaller articles the first article is gig workers suffer from lack of social security and regulations according to study this probably is an article which we will discuss tomorrow also because today the details of this study are supposed to come so maybe it will help us in understanding that better because overall there are a lot of data that has been published in this article that for example nearly one third of the app based cab drivers work for more than 14 hours in a day and as you can see here the first few lines more than 83 percent of the uh, more than 83 percent work more than 10 hours and more 60 percent work more than 12 hours according to this study that was conducted and that's why uh, there are a lot of issues that have been talked about in this context of this article so we'll discuss that in more detail if uh, the report details come out in uh, in uh, today's uh, it is supposed to come out today now overall it talks about gig economy all right it talks about gig economy and it talks about the various aspects basically of gig economy and the problem that right now we are looking at with regards to gig economy the kinds of the social disparities and the income issues etc all these things have been uh, discussed in this article now when it comes to this we need to also understand what do we mean by this gig economy because we have seen that over the past few years the number of people who are employed in gig economy who are a part of gig economy in india that number has been increasing over time and now with this increasing number there are certain uh, advantages that we have but at the same time there are a lot of issues for example we talk about the health and safety concerns of uh, a, a lot of these uh, people who are a part of the gig economy so that's why whether it is the delivery services whether it is the cab services in all these uh, places we see that there are challenges that they are facing and these challenges have to be addressed with regards to uh, this so that's why there are broader uh, recommendations that are also have been given uh, by this uh, by this report what it talks about that okay these are the problems these are the economic problems social problems health related problems etc and then it also talks about certain recommendations that what exactly can be done to strengthening some of the things with regards to this so what do we mean by gig economy gig economy basically is a kind of labor market where you can say that it is characterized by prevalence of short term contracts or freelance work as opposed to permanent jobs and that's why in this economy the individuals who are working they work as independent contractors or temporary workers or maybe also freelancers uh, 
often we see that they would be connecting with the clients or customers through digital platforms and apps for these services. Uh, so that's why whether it is uh, the cab services or food delivery or maybe freelance tasks which are maybe related to writing or programming etc. All these things will become a part of gig economy. So that's why we see that gig economy becomes very very crucial and it gives flexibility to uh, the people to choose from there they want to work, when they want to work, their working hours, all these things can be balanced out and in a manner it, uh, it gives an independence that the gig workers typically are operating in an independent manner and that's why they are not bound by any specific com uh, company policies and uh, hence what also happens is that they do not have any benefits of jo or job security which the traditional employees have. So that's why we see that uh, this gig economy is something that has been uh, developing right now in the country specifically. Then the second article that we have is a small article. Cheetah gives birth to five cubs in Madhya Pradesh's Kuno National Park. Now this Kuno National Park uh, has been also in the news for the last few years and largely it has been in the news for with regards to the cheetah uh, reintroduction plan that we have right now in India. So overall when it comes to the cheetah reintroduction plan this is a plan that has been in the news for a long time there have been debates about the positives and the negatives of these kind of uh, efforts. So. <clears throat> And we have seen that there have been a, there have been comprehensive reports also that have been published with regards to the reintroduction plan. So overall, when it comes to the reintroduction plan, we'll discuss about what the reintroduction plan is. So this reintroduction plan, we see that this was the entire plan initially that we had. That 20 in total, 20 cheetahs in total would come uh, from Africa. So, so this will be about. Uh, cheetah reintroduction plan and this has been a reintroduction plan this has been a very significant conservation effort which has been aimed at restoring the cheetah population in the country and especially when it comes to the Asian cheetah that was found in India traditionally and there is a long story behind that also but unfortunately cheetahs became extinct in India due to rapid hunting and habitat loss that happened with them. So that's why uh, there was a reintroduction plan and the project initiation happened when officially we in initiated uh, as a part of the effort to conserve the wildlife and reintroduce them in the Indian context. We see that there was uh, a nod that was given by the Supreme Court in 2020. And then after that we saw that India notably started collaborating with Namibia and South Africa and these are the two countries from where these cheetah were introduced and the site that we chose was Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh and this has been very very important because we see that this is a national park which has a fenced 600 hectare land and that's why it has been seen as an adequate base for cheetahs translocation. An initial translocation started in September 2022 and this is where you can say that in a manner it uh, marked the return of the cheetahs to India after almost 70 years. So overall this is basically what we are looking at with regards to the cheetah reintroduction program and this is where uh, it would help in uh, also maintaining the open forest and the grasslands etc in the country. Now overall when it comes to the cheetah reintroduction program sorry uh, uh, coming to the next article that we have and this is about introducing a new toll collection system. Now this article basically talks about the introduction of a new toll collection system that was announced uh, by our tra uh, road transport and highways minister Nitin Gadkari and he had announced this in the month of February that we would be implementing a new highway toll syst uh, collection system which will be based on uh, the GPS satellites and this is something that is going to be done very soon according to what has been told. Now overall when it comes to this system, uh, it, there are two things that we need to understand in the context of this article. One is about fast tag, about what exactly do we mean by fast tag and then the other thing is about the Gagan satellites in India. Now first thing is fast tag, what do we mean by fast tag? Fast tag basically is 
a model that right now we are using which is you might have seen that these fast tags are there on uh, on our vehicles and these fast tags can be read by the toll booth plazas so now the toll plazas basically will be having a reader the reader can read the information that is there on the fast tag that we are using and this fast tag basically it works on something called as rfid radio frequency identification so this radio frequency identification is a method that <coughs> that is used for communicating between a reader and a tag so what we have is a tag what the toll plaza has is a reader so that's why the communication happens between the reader and the tag so the fast tags basically will be reading the information from the tag they will be able to take the collection or take the payment from the tag which are there in our uh, vehicles so works on the principle of radio frequency identification just remember these basics then one more very very important fact is about the gagan satellites which has been mentioned in this article now gagan stands for gps aided geo augmented navigation g a g a n so now when it comes to the gagan architecture the gagan architecture basically is a set of satellites that we have now these set of satellites they are gps and gsat satellites so we are using a combination of the two so we have the gps satellites and we have the gsat satellites so gsat satellites are basically indian satellites indian communication satellites and gps satellites are the global navigation system so as a collection or you can say a system which is based out of these two systems the gagan architecture works now this <coughs> gagan architecture basically was established by air force uh, airports authority of india and isro these two collaborated and they basically came out with the gagan system and this gagan system primarily was made for helping civil aviation in the country it was primarily made for helping civil aviation in the country but it doesn't only help civil aviation but it also helps in a lot of different ways when it comes to navigation and positioning so that's why it can help in road transport it can help in railway transport it can help in water transport it can help in uh, geological studies so there are a lot of ways in which the gagan architecture or the gagan set of satellites can be useful and here in this article we are saying that the gagan architecture will be primarily used in making this kind of a system work that we will be basing this new toll collection system on the gagan architecture so that's why gagan architecture here in this context becomes very crucial then the next article is about bitcoins now with regards to what we have seen in bitcoins is that bitcoins have seen a record high a new record high that on 5th of march the bitcoins had reached a new high that they had never seen so all of a sudden there have been uh, sudden market recoveries that we have seen in bitcoin market and there have been various factors for example one factor has been recovery from the 2022 downturn that we had seen after russia's invasion of ukraine and then apart from that we have seen that there have been certain other aspects as well so for example uh, there have been some developments in the us uh, for the use of bitcoins that also has led to the increase in the value of bitcoins now apart from all this there is one concept specially which is called as bitcoin halving and this concept of bitcoin halving specially becomes very crucial in the context of uh, the you, uh, the increase in the value of bitcoin that we have seen so when it comes to bitcoin halving bitcoin halving is something that happens almost every 4 years and that is something that it actually uh, halves the uh, rewards that you get out of mining of bitcoin so essentially what we want is that we want to maintain uh, the scarcity of bitcoins and that's why the value uh, or the value of bitcoin and that's why this concept of halving is used now overall uh, what we should understand is that although the numbers have been very high that they have reached new high but there is a huge volatility that we always see in this market and for the new investors and if there is any one of you who is listening to this lecture and wants or is investing in the crypto market 
you should always be wary of the market's volatility because you will see that there are significant prices changing um, significant change in the prices and fluctuations that we see over a very short period of time and that's why uh, it can be actually very stressful and within a very short period of time within a couple of minutes or maybe in a couple of hours you might lose a lot of money that will be unimaginable for a lot of us so that's why i mean you have to either be an expert or stay away so that's why you have to understand this now bitcoin halving what do we mean by bitcoin halving bitcoin halving basically is a process that has been embedded in the bitcoin protocol that reduces the reward for mining new blocks by halving almost by halving the reward that you get for bitcoins and this happens almost every four years that bitcoin halving basically means that rewards for mining mining meaning creating new bitcoins mining bitcoins are halved so that's why bitcoin halving because the rewards are halved and this is a very crucial feature of a Bitcoin's economic model, which is designed to enforce scarcity in this value. And that's where this is where we see that it becomes very crucial because Bitcoin miners, the people who are mining for Bitcoins or who are creating Bitcoins, they solve very complex mathematical puzzles using computational powers of uh, the computers that they are using. And that is something that will create new Bitcoins. Now for their efforts of creating new Bitcoins, they are rewarded with newly minted Bitcoins. And this reward is what gets halved every four years. So overall, you have to understand that when it comes to halving of the schedule, we see that halving event happens every uh, after every two lakh one ten thousand Bitcoins. And that's why we see that it takes almost four years for this to happen. And this is where you decrease the rates or the rewards being given. The basic purpose here is to have a mechanism that is designed to ensure that the production rate of a commodity uh, like Bitcoin is always maintained in the market. And overall, it artificially tries to limit the supply. And that's why it helps in preventing of the inflation in these kind of scenarios. And overall, you have to understand that when it comes to Bitcoin, Bitcoin supply has a limit. That overall limit for the supply of Bitcoins is 21 million. So there are only 21 million Bitcoins that can exist. And that's why this halving becomes a very crucial process in uh, a very critical part of how the Bitcoins will try to aim to ensure that this gap is reached without ever exceeding this gap. And halving will continue until the mining reward becomes so small that it rounds to almost zero, which is expected to happen. Uh, around the year 2140 so a lot of time before this will happen so ultimately this is basically what uh, it is supposed to do so that is what bitcoin uh, halving is and this is where we see that it always has a lot of em effect on um, on the market of bitcoin and that is why we have seen that uh, it potentially because of the speculations we see that it leads to price movements in the bitcoin market and very often we see that there will be very significant price adjustments as well so right now the prices have gone up uh, the anticipation of a reduced supply and the increasing scarcity can also lead to a lot of price surge that is happening right now and this is something where it can suddenly drop also so in the coming days so that's why we have to look at a long-term outlook where we need to understand when uh, and what are the reasons that can lead to increase or decrease in the value then lastly a small uh, discussion about a new survey that has been done on golden langurs of india now golden langurs basically these are endangered species these are endangered species of primates which are very very crucial because and they are called as golden langus because they have a golden to creamy white fur that they have and that is something which is very contrast to their faces which are completely black and they basically are arboreal in nature they primarily live on the trees of the deciduous forest and the evergreen forest that are very often found in the northeast india and especially in assam so so largely you'll find them in assam and also in bhutan they are also found in Bhutan. 
so overall they basically you will see that they their diet mainly consists of leaves and but they also can uh, consume fruits and flowers also and at the same time what we see is that they are living in social groups they generally live in social groups and consistently uh, uh, they might have some, uh, certain uh, adult males and females also uh, uh, along with their offsprings who would be there in the social structure overall you also have to understand that they have been classified as endangered species and this is largely because of habitat loss because of habitat fragmentation and poaching so that also has led to their uh, uh, populations which have dwindled over the past few years now lastly coming to the main questions so these are the questions that we have today for you discuss the implications of the ss dhanoa versus union of india case on the autonomy and functioning of the election commission of india analyze how the verdict affects the relationship between chief election commissioner and other election commissioners and the broader implication for democratic governance in india so overall we have to basically talk about some of the functions that we discuss and some of the criteria for uh, looking at the functions and how there has to be a balance of power in this uh, this uh, situation and then the second question examine the socio economic and environmental implications of declining number of lakes in bengaluru considering the rapid urbanization and associated challenges so we discussed about a lot of issues we discussed what's happening and we also discussed about some of the scenarios where we can reform the situation as well so you can write about that also as a way forward towards the end of this answer so these are the two questions and so this is it for today's lecture i hope this discussion helps you these are some of the topics which are very crucial and these are topics which will be running areas in the coming days as well so please have a look out on any new development also that happens in these scenarios thank you